Hello and welcome to Grad Dialogue. You know, uh, today my guest is Dave Tatman. You know, Dave is uh, new to this region. However, it's not new to Kentucky nor to the automotive industry. And we have invited him to talk about the what is happening in the automotive industry, and especially, you know, some of the surprises that we are all so fortunate to have for the Commonwealth here in, in our Commonwealth. So for those of you who may not know, Dave Tatman uh, was recently named the inaugural executive director of the Kentucky Automotive Industry Association. And he, he also serves as a WKU, Western Kentucky University, as an associate uh, vice president for the advanced manufacturing. I think that is a great uh, position, especially, you know, the challenges we all face in manufacturing and everything else. Mm -hmm. Dave also tells me that he is the only staff person for the association. Yeah, right. So, you know, right. I guess we are fortunate to have him. Very impressive resume, by the way. Dave retired a short time ago after 34 year career at the General Motors, uh, most recently as a plant manager for the Corvette plant in Bowling Green. He oversaw $131 million worth of investment to upgrade the plant and equipment and adding a 350 new jobs to produce the all new 2014 everybody's dream car, <laughs> you know, Corvette Stingray, which was named as the North American uh, car of the year in January of 2014. And he's also as a general manager up in 13 different manufacturing facilities in the three countries uh, and two continents. So honored to have you know somebody you know that caliber to be our guest today. It's my pleasure. Uh, Dave, uh, you know he has a master's of business administration and corporate policy at the University of Michigan, and also the bachelor of science in industrial and system engineering from Ohio State University. Dave, welcome to the Grad Dialogue and my board. As you saw but through your presentation, also some other great discussion afterwards. Yep, you bet. That we are really yep. uh, amazed. Uh, and I th let me, I'm going to start off with some, one of the things that even my, some of my elected officials were surprised to learn that the Kentucky is the third largest automotive industry, uh, uh, automotive manufacturing state in, in the country. So. Yeah, it is. Let me say first, uh -huh. uh, Michelle, I appreciate being here. It's, great, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to... Uh, uh, to speak to you and to speak to your board and then to speak to your audience here today. Um, as I said, I often uh, spend, I find myself spending a lot of time on I-65 and I-75 going north. It's nice, kind of nice to come <laughs> from my home just outside of Bowling Green over here at Owensboro, so I appreciate that. But I think that uh, one of the things that um, when I retired from General Motors um, a couple of years ago, uh, I got a phone call from then uh, Cabinet Secretary Larry Hayes. Uh -huh. He was Cabinet Secretary for the Economic Development Cabinet. And uh, Larry said, congratulations on your retirement. I mean, I'd known Larry's through some other business right, dealings. Right. I, he said, congratulations on your retirement. He says, now what are you going to do? And I said, well, I think I'm done working for General Motors, but I don't think I'm done working. He said, good, because the Kentucky automotive industry uh -huh. needs a face. It needs a voice. It needs a, an organization that will advocate on its, um, uh, on its uh, behalf. And so that conversation has turned into the Kentucky Automotive Industry Association. Most people in Kentucky and many, many people outside of Kentucky mm -hmm. don't realize the fact that you just mentioned, and that is that Kentucky is the third largest state in the country with respect to automotive production. Only Michigan and Ohio make more cars and trucks uh -huh. than we do right here in the Commonwealth. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, you, know, you also mentioned earlier that uh, since, uh, I guess, the last 10 years or so, that the, uh, uh, the jobs in automotive mm -hmm. industries nationally has been declining. Right. But that's not the case in Kentucky? Not at all. In fact, um, we've seen a, a, a rather precipitous decline since 1990 uh, in automotive jobs in total in the U.S. Uh, however, in Kentucky, we've seen a growth in automotive employment o over 170 percent in jobs since 1990. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, of course, a lot of that has been driven by our friends over in Georgetown as Toyota decided to locate here. Uh, that brought lots of, um, lots of suppliers, but uh, you know, Ford has been in Louisville for over 100 years. They're a great, uh, a great corporate citizen there, and they've drawn a lot in. And of course, the iconic Chevrolet Corvette being built in Bowling Green since 1981 uh, has brought suppliers to the to the. Uh, Dave, uh, you know, when you mentioned those things, those are the those are the kind of flagship you know, oh, yeah. automotive industries for Kentucky. Yeah. You know, in in uh, in uh, Georgetown and in in Louisville mm -hmm. and in Bowling Green. Right. But that is not the uh, the total story when you talk about the automotive jobs. Not at all. Uh -huh. Not at all. In fact. Uh, throughout the Commonwealth, there are 490 different manufacturing plants producing automotive components or, or, uh, or parts of one type or another. 
And when you think about that, that, comp that uh, comprises almost 90,000 direct employees in those places, contributing wow. over $6 billion in annual payroll to the state of Kentucky. Um, and those plants are located all over the state. Now, there's 120 counties in the state of Kentucky, and 80 of them have an automotive manufacturing or more, plant or more in them. <laughs> but uh, the reality is that, um, um, that there is a huge amount of, of automotive work going on in the state mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. places you'd never guess. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I go into some of these supplier plants, and they might be 25 or 50 employees, might be 4,000 employees, but the, uh, those tiny little shops dot the landscape throughout the Commonwealth. Yeah. And, it's a pleasure for me to visit yeah. them. I think when you you know when you when you when you talk that and then you think think back, and I was surprised to even you know put it all together too because all of our seven counties in grad, mm -hmm. you know have a, you know most of the county more than one automotive mm -hmm. oh, yeah. suppliers oh, industries yeah. you know yeah. and it has been there for many many years you know yeah. so, yeah. and and it is and, and that's why one of the reasons I, I love coming out here is as you know I was down in in Henderson recently for a right. new announcement down there for an automotive firm choosing to locate in Henderson which is great news for that community and great news for that company. Um, and we do see an increasing presence, um, uh, has been here over time, and an increasing presence in this region. Mm -hmm. And I'm delighted uh, for the work done by the grad to, uh, to accelerate that and to welcome those businesses to this well, region. Thank you. I think we're really excited about having somebody from South Africa moving to Henderson. How about that, know? huh? Yeah. That's yeah. the first South African uh, automotive company to locate uh -huh. in the state of Kentucky, uh -huh. and they're doing it right there in Henderson, in Henderson. Kentucky. Yeah. Now, that's a cool yeah. thing. And I think you were there when the announcement was, was. made, and I was also surprised yeah. to, to learn that the owner of the company is going to move to Henderson. Right, you know? and so, I understood yeah. today from Judge Executive Executive Schneider that uh -huh. uh, he's already found a home and uh, he thinks and uh, so he's he's all about getting to be it's a great, getting to be yeah, a Kentuckian yeah, yeah. which I understand very well I moved to Kentucky to, to run the Bowling Green plant uh -huh. and uh, and uh, I decided to retire so I could stay here. I didn't want to go any other place. There you go. See, my, first, <laughs> my first 12 plants were on my way to get to Kentucky. Hey, same thing here. I've been there here for go. 43 years in Owensboro so <laughs> I think it's a, we've got a good choice and everything. Now um, the you know, visiting, uh, taking some de delegations from Czech Republic to visit mm. the Corvette plant, and mm. as a tourism and everything else, also as well as how sure. technology has changed and everything else, I'm sure that the the, the future of Corvettes is always going to be strong and continue to be strong. But what do you think about the o overall automotive industries? You know, and in, in not only in in Kentucky but also in the U.S. Yeah. market. Well, that's a great question and one that uh, we often ponder in the industry because we are in the midst of a technological revolution in uh -huh, the automotive uh -huh. business. This is not an evolutionary change, this is a revolutionary change. As we look at the increased level of technology in our cars, the microprocessors, the control systems, um, the, uh, the crash avoidance, the autonomous levels of our vehicles, all those things are adding more and more complexity to the vehicle. Uh -huh. the, the, that pace of technological change is also inviting new players into the field. I mean, Apple and Google and right, others that right. are, are coming in the field. We think about issues such as ride sharing like Lyft or Uber and what their impact on the, on the business is going to be. So there are major changes uh, underway inside the automotive industry, which, which I think by and large bode well for the industry and bode well for the state of Kentucky. Um, for instance, there's a, 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 an increased push um, from the federal EPA for better fuel economy. And we've been working hard on that for a number of years, but it's to get to 50 miles per gallon average, corporate average fuel economy by 2025. Well, there are companies right here in the state of Kentucky that are wholly engaged in that effort to, uh, to allow better control systems, better engine management hardware uh, mm -hmm. for our vehicles to assure that we can make those goals in the time frames mm -hmm. specified. So, so the automotive technology is probably more on a reality then like today Amazon you know announced and finally showed that a package was delivered by a drone in, in rural London you know by yeah. drone yeah. Uh, however uh, you see more and more automotive industries including GM uh -huh. looking into uh, you know driverless cars and all those I things. think it's I think it's really important to note that um, while uh, the domestic three uh, for GM and what was then Chrysler now Fiat Chrysler um, have been accused of being sort of bureaucratic, stuck in the trenches, uh -huh. you know, rust belt type of industries. Uh, they, along with every other OEM in the world, is really getting engaged in this technology thing. Um, you see GM has developed a partnership with Lyft. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, um, the, the idea that um, those o any of the OEMs are going to stand by and watch this thing happen, no. Everybody's really actively engaged in this technological uh -huh. change. Uh -huh. 
So uh, you know, when, you, when you talk about the new technology and in, you know, the changes in the automotive industry, mm -hmm. that also brings uh, different types of skills oh. for the typical automotive you know, workers. So right. can you comment on those? Great question. Um, the, uh, the need for uh, workers in our industry is huge. Um, and the need for those workers here in Kentucky is particularly acute. Um, and we need uh, people from our, our entry level production technician jobs to our skilled maintenance uh, uh, technicians. Um, we need them for uh, quality control um, operators, all those factory floor level stuff. Because uh -huh. by and large, Kentucky is a, is a manufacturing state. That's what we do. Um, and, and then when you think about the technology, it's a constant demand for engineers and scientists and others. But I think the important thing to note is that in those jobs, um, the world, particularly for the factory floor jobs, uh -huh. the world is way different today than it was when I started for General Motors in that uh, we aren't looking just for their hands. We need their hearts and their minds as well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, every, every automotive worker in this state is organized into a small work group of a team led by a team leader who reports to an, an, a, a supervisor. Um, they, they, people have to learn to work collaboratively. Uh, uh, we, we want them to bring their creativity to work, their innovation. Um, and, you know, just the, the whole nature of what we're expecting out of our employees today is different. And it's really good. I mean, it's really good. I think that, uh, you know, when I started working for General Motors, it was like, you know, just put these lug nuts on and move the car down the line. And now we're saying, no, wait a minute, is this the best way to do that? Are these the best tools for you? Right. Are these parts in the right, right. place? Right. Is this ergonomically sensitive? Is there appropriate airflow? All the kinds of things that matter to our workers today, uh -huh. we're paying attention uh -huh. to. Now, you know, that, that's a good point to, to bring into your second job, mm -hmm. which is now to, to provide the advanced manufacturing, I guess, uh, uh, assistance technology. and, and yeah. technology training and everything at the WKU. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that the colleges and technical schools in Kentucky or even in this part of the region are tooling to, to meet that demand that you just talked about? Well, there are a lot of challenges in higher education in our state, as you well know. Um, but I am delighted by the response that I get from educators throughout yeah. the state yeah. who really do understand that their responsibility is to provide a product that we can put to work. That is people, skilled people who want to, who want to come to work every day and, and do a good job. And, and our partners, you know, like Owensboro Technical College, right. like um, uh, the Area Technology Centers, our vocational high schools, right. like our high schools are looking at careers. All those things are significant contributors to that. And um, while, you know, as we look at the performance funding formula being discussed at the state level now for higher, you know, higher uh, education, all those kinds of things are there. But underlying all that, I get a real strong sense from our, uh -huh. from our educational institutions, from high schools all the way through colleges and universities, that they get that they've got a responsibility in this thing. Well, that's excellent. But importantly, yeah. but importantly, more so than ever, industry, we understand mm -hmm. that we've got a role in that too. Mm -hmm. We've got to stand up and say, here's what we need. Mm -hmm. And we've got to participate in internship programs and cooperative education programs and work experiences and, and summer experiences for teachers and all those kinds of things that help us help each other mm -hmm. in this ecosystem of labor. Now, when you talk about those things, there's another third leg to the whole situation is the, uh, the, 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 the Kentucky. The sure. Frankfurt, yeah, oh yeah. You know, the the General Assembly is coming up in January. Yeah. So, do you think that are they situated? Are they there are certain issues that are going to have an impact on the automotive industry, or oh, very do you much like so. to see something that happen? Very much so. I, I do spend a little bit of my time uh, focusing on those issues, and um, we're concerned about roads and infrastructure. Uh, we want to make sure that the uh, the the fuel tax funding formula is one that stays intact and does go to bridges and roads and airports and river ports and those kinds of things. Um, we want to see continued emphasis on workforce development activities. The governor has proposed a $100 million right. uh, grant, participative grant, and we're anxious to see how that plays out because we think that's got a powerful influence on it. And we're looking for uh, Kentucky to form an even more friendly business climate in terms of, of um, well, right to work legislation was probably right. one that'll, be, that'll get uh, get on the table fairly quickly, and and we're looking for tax reform. Um, that'll probably be a special session or some other. Sure. We won't get it done sure. in a one month session, but uh, I, I think that uh, that the environment right now is really really good uh, mm -hmm. for the for for business in general and certainly uh, the automotive industry. David, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tadman. I think uh, you know we learned a lot about the automotive industry, but the main thing is also also how are we you know, still positioned to be, stay strong in automotive manufacturing and the jobs. Again, welcome and uh, welcome to the grad as well as the dialogue.
been my pleasure, Michelle. Right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. And we've been talking to Dave Tatman. He's the uh, former plant manager of Corbett Industry in Bowling Green. Along with that, he's the executive director of Kentucky Association of Automotive Industries. And if you have any questions or comments, you can always contact me at the grad office, 926-4433. And have a great day. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the Grad Dialogue. My guest today is Mrs. Sylvia Coleman. Uh, she is the executive director of the Owensboro Human Relations Commission. And, uh, you know, I would like to talk to her about what's happening in our region and especially in Owensboro and Davis County. Uh, she has been in that position since uh, 2013. Uh, you know, she's not a native, native of Owensboro, so I'm, let me just kind of have a brief introduction for her. Uh, she is a native of uh, Dangriga, hope I'm pronouncing right, Dangriga, Belize. Uh, I guess she's like me, you know, I, you know immigrant you know, from other country. She moved to the United States in 1995 when she attended the Spalding University in Louisville and also been a graduate of 1997 with a Bachelor of Arts in, uh, in liberal, liberal Studies uh, from the University of Louisville. This was also Louisville as no, well? it was. Um, Spalding University is in Louisville. Is in Louisville, yes. right. And then I went to Kentucky State University. I say, okay, Kentucky State University, you had the Master in Public Administration yes. and also uh, Specialty in International Development and Administration. Uh, so again, uh, you know, great education. Uh, her experience, you know, that was very exciting to read about that. Uh, she, is, uh, she has a lot of experience in diversity recruitment program, uh, program management and community development. Uh, she has worked for the Job Bank Administrator, uh, Health Educator, a training program a coordinator for, uh, act, uh, and also for the training program coordinator, and also been an acting city clerk for the city of Riverdale in Georgia, and also the pol policy and political advisor to the mayor and council of Dangriga town of Belize. Sylvia, welcome on the Grad Dialogue. Maybe sometime you can just talk about the Dangriga. That sounds Most so exciting to do that too, you know. So, so uh, with that kind of background, uh, I guess it was a kind of uh, uh, ideal for you to take this position as a Human Relations Commission. Certainly. Well, first of all, thank you for having You're me welcome. on your show. Um, you know, I believe that everything happens by divine design. Uh -huh. um, and I'm <clears throat> hardly your most religious person, but I'm just going to say that things happen by divine design. We moved here four years ago, and I had been a stay-at-home mom. Um, young girl in junior college walking home uh -huh. from school with my two best friends. And I said, you know, I hope that I will have a husband who makes enough money to take care of me so I can go back to work when our youngest child turns seven. Um, they say, be careful what you wish for, because um, we had a baby. And the day he turned seven, I got a call that I had been offered the executive director position at Human Relations Commission. Um, and I like to think that, uh, you know what, um, it's probably one of my greatest uh -huh. job fits um, because I believe in everything that the Human Relations Commission stands for. Um, and, and I like to think that my professional and personal experiences mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have prepared me to mm -hmm. carry on the kind of work that I do. Well, I think, I think it's a great accomplishment for somebody, you know, who is coming from Belize in, what, 1995? Yes. And uh, not only accomplish the great education, you know, bachelor and master's, uh, but also getting a, in a, a job as an executive director of the relations that, you know, if you think about it, I'm uh, putting, you know, myself into your position too. <coughs> we come from a different country. That's right. Trying to, you know, learn about the new ways, the new country. At the same time, people believe in you right. to give you the position as you have received. Definitely. <coughs> that, is, that is excellent. Yeah. So, and, that, uh, as, and, 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 and as, as a former, as I told you earlier, as a former chairman of the Human Relations Commission in Owensboro, I'm glad that, the, you know, we have a, you know, your, your type of quality to lead the organization. Well, thank you very much. So, so tell me about, you know, some of the big issues that you are, uh, you know, not that you are facing, but you would like to, you know, accomplish as a community when it comes to the uh, human relations. Um, one of the things that I learned within my first 14 days at Human Relations Commission was that um, housing is a major, uh -huh. major issue. Um, and so I was forced to go back and look at previous years and learn that um, you get a wide range of complaints in edu edu some education issues, employment issues, mm -hmm. public accommodation, but there was nothing like the housing complaints. I Same. mean, there, there are some months you get 
13 complaints and 12 of those complaints are housing. housing. And so I brought that to the board's attention and said, look, um, I, this is my observation and what are we doing as a commission to fix mm -hmm, this? Mm -hmm. um, and it was then that I learned that the city um, and the county that within our area that we have no real protection for landlords or tenants. You know, um, yeah. We are guided by common law where most people would say landlord is king um, and tenants pretty much have to take what's given to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that extremely unacceptable. Um, now, I will be the first to say that we have a lot of wonderful landlords sure, in sure. our community. Um, however, we also have landlords who um, are not so wonderful. Right. Um, and so I find that there are people who move into a house and they don't have a lease. Mm -hmm. um, leases are one-sided. I've seen leases, a lease that said, it is my property and I can come in there whenever mm -hmm. I want. Um, and a, a lot of our citizens um, live where they live because that is what they can afford. Um, and I believe in as much as we talk about things, we should also be driven to find workable solutions for all parties involved. And so um, I have to give credit. It was Harvey, 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 Harvey Howell, Howell. Yeah. Yeah, who came to me and he said, you know, there is something that exist to solve this problem. It's called the Uniform Residential Landlord right. and Tenant Act. So thank you very much, Harvey. And I decided that I was going to do my research. Um, I talked with Susan Gesser from mm -hmm. the Legal Aid, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I did enough research and found that, you know what, the Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act does favor both landlord and tenants. Right. Um, prior to public opinion, you know, there are some landlords who are so against it because they think it's another way of regulating business. Um, I like to think that housing is not just your ordinary mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Families, safety, families' health, it's families' well-being, it depends Absolutely. on this. I mean, yes, yes. Um, if, a, if a child is homeless, it affects right, how everything. that child right. learns, yeah. it affects the parents' ability mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to get to work. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that the Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act is a win-win. It protects landlords, it protects tenants. But, but um, you do get a support from the, from the city of Owensboro or at least continue to look into those kind of issues. I know that the Kentucky Human, Rela Human Relations uh, Office, Human, Human, Human Relations Rights Commission, Rights Commission mm -hmm. uh, they're also probably support, support on the fair housing issues. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, okay. You know, I, the, the city has entertained conversation about it, um, but we need to move beyond entertaining conversation. Right. Um, right. And so one of the things that we are planning on doing this year, we, we have our executive cycles and they run two years. And so we're at the end of an executive cycle and then we'll have new, a new executive com uh -huh. committee come um, January 1. Um, but one of the things that we are planning to do is that we are going to broaden this conversation. Um, the county also has to be involved sure. because as I, as I drive around Owensboro, um, you know, I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago and I said, you know, I think Frederica's Walmart was built 10 years ago. Um, uh, at least 10 years ago was the first time I went there. Um, I was in Owensboro for a family event and a cousin said, hey, let's drive out there. And it seemed so far and remote. Right. Um, and I was driving through there yesterday mm -hmm. and I realized this is not far and remote anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but the question is, where does the city end and where does the county begin? And, and so we have to work collectively if we're gonna create laws that protect people. Um, I was a little, rushed coming here because I was on the phone mm -hmm. with a citizen who lives in the county who has a housing issue. Um, and so how do you balance a resident in the city and one in the county um, on housing? So we certainly have to mm -hmm. um, work mm -hmm. to make this a county. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think if the county and, adopts and, and the I ordinance... Believe, I believe the county government be open to that discussion too. Most, and, um, most definitely. And all, yeah. and so I, I think that's, that's excellent what you're doing and you know, a good uniform you know, regulations. You know, it's already in the book anyway, so why yes. can we implement that? Now, besides the housing, you know, I think I want to also compliment on, on, the, on, on the diversity and, 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 and just uh, you know, understanding of the human, you know, human rights and everything else. And I think there's an example 
is that in the you, you know, uh, I led the movement in the community, you know, to show our solidarity uh, when uh, you know some vandalism occurred at the Islamic Center of Owensboro. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that you know, then the whole community got together and you know, kind of shows that hey, those kind of things should not be uh, tolerated in our community. So that's something that. You know that that goes beyond you know De uh, definitely yeah, and, and, and you know i i will not take the credit for leading yeah, the effort yeah. however i reached out to other community right, leaders right. but that's what that right. that's what makes us american um you have your own experiences growing up i have my own experiences growing up um but i think that the one thing that unifies us no matter where we come mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. um as as, as, as people, as immigrants, is that sense of looking out for the next person. Mm -hmm. and, and I also have to commend the community mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for showing up. Um, you know, religion will divide us if we allow religion to divide us. And as the Human Relations Commission or as a human rights advocacy group, um, we have to make sure that all sure. people are protected, sure. no matter what their race, gender, religion, mm -hmm. um, national origin, age, ability, disability, mm -hmm. and hopefully someday I will be able to say, and I live in a community or a state where people are also protected because of their sexual orientation or their gender identities. Right. Yeah. Um, it, to me, it's not about where I stand personally or religiously. It's by it's doing the right thing right. by right. your fellow human yeah. brother or sister. And, and, and I know as time goes on, you know, with the, with the new discussion that is going on at the and 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 state capital and nation's capital is going to have an impact on how you know you would be spending your energy in trying Definitely. to you know, find the balance and all those De understanding and everything else. Now, beside the housing issue and besides some of the issues that we talked about, what do you think the challenges that you face in the upcoming year? You know, being an executive director of OHRC. You know, I, I think that um, our unwillingness to have frank conversations uh -huh, about uh -huh. issues that divide us. Um, civil rights is not only about race. And, and I think that um, I've worked with a number of organizations in this community who have no problems talking about race, but then it depends, you, you can only go so far with right, race. Right. Um, because everybody's quick to say, well, I'm not racist. Well, speaking about race does not suggest that you are a right. racist. Yeah. Um, how do I get to know who you are? How do I get to know what your challenges are? Mm -hmm. How do I mm -hmm. get to understand who you are and better work with you mm -hmm. in spite of our differences if mm -hmm. we cannot mm -hmm. talk about those differences? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, I, I think that we also have to move beyond just talking. Um, you know, I've read that in a lot of places where, where, where race relations or um, intercultural relations have advanced is because they've also seriously talked Doing about, about it. and, and, and they've, they've, they've done work on right, reconciliation. Right, right, yeah. and, and, and I think that we need to truly, yeah. no matter what your religious conviction is, we really need to take stock right. of who we are and forgive ourselves and forgive others. And that's Agreed. the only way we will be Agreed. able to move forward and stop making excuses. Right, right. Um, you know, I recently said to a group of people I talked with, let's stop being sorry. Let's turn our sorry into action. That's excellent yeah. point. And yeah. I, I think I want to wish you best of luck in doing all those things. Let me also extend, you know, that the grad, you know, would be glad and personally myself too, glad to work with you to maybe have some sort of, you know, forum or, or discussion or have it in a town hall meetings Certainly. because I think you know everything that happens in the human relations has a, has impact on everything we do so I want to thank you for doing what you're doing and also wish you best of luck in your position thank and uh, maybe you know you'll be here for a long long time in that position as well so yes, again, thank well, you thank we've you been, for having uh, me. we've been talking to Sylvia Coleman and this is the executive director of the human relations commission in Owensboro and some of the issues that affect uh, human relations housing and, and uh, race relations and all those things if you have any questions or comments, please always contact me at the grad office, or you can also contact Sylvia at the Human Relations uh, Commission's office in Owensboro. Thank you, and have a great day.